Good evening. My name is Christopher Wendt. I'm the International Director of the Confraternity of Our Lady of Fatima. And tonight I'm joined with His Excellency Bishop Athanasius Schneider and also Dr. Michael Cirilla, Professor of Dogmatic Theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville. I'm, we're all so excited uh, that you're here, Your Excellency. Thank you for coming on. Um, tonight's format is going to be a Q&A session again, like we've done in the past. Uh, as you recall, last time we did a catechism class with His Excellency, but since then we've got hundreds of questions that have come in. In fact, just from today, we got about 30 new ones. So we're going to try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, we typically can cover about 20 questions in one session like this. Um, we're also going, because there are, because there are so many questions, we're going to do another Q&A session April the 13th on uh, at 9 p.m. as well, Eastern time. But I have an announcement that I'm very excited about. On May the 13th, uh, it's going to be a special evening. Um, His Excellency has decided to um, start a worldwide consecration to Our Lady, according to St. Louis de Montfort. And um, he's going to lead us on April the 13th in the consecration prayer that St. Louis de Montfort uh, uh, wrote. That consecration is going to uh, process or the preparation for the consecration is going to start on April the 10th and run to May the 13th. You are all invited to that. And if you want to be a part of it, all you have to do is email us at info at livefatima.io. That's info at livefatima.io. Email us and say, please put me on the list and we will get you on the list. Um, we are going to send out a daily email with the consecration prayers so that you have what you need to make the consecration. You can also request this book from Tan Publishing. This is an awesome book. Um, it's a vinyl cover and um, it's really handy to use. Um, and we'll all be using that book and the email, uh, the, the email will have the, the daily prayers for that. One other thing that's exciting is we're celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Catholic faith in the Philippines. Uh, in 1521, on March the 31st, the Spanish celebrated the first mass in the Philippines. And at the end of this evening, after we say the prayer um, for the consecration, uh, or the prayer that the Holy Father will make the consecration, I'm going to ask His Excellency to bless uh, the, the Philippine nation as they celebrate 500 years of the Catholic faith. And without further ado, I'm going to turn this evening over to Dr. Michael Cirilla, who will be asking uh, your questions. Michael? Thank you, Christopher. I'd like to ask His Excellency if he would lead us in a, in a prayer tonight. In nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. Pater Nostra, qui es in celis, sanctificeto nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, Sicut in cielo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos da malo. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, Thank you, Christopher. It, it is such a blessing to be with you all again, uh, even more so now than ever, as things seem to intensify in the uh, spiritual warfare. Um, and uh, on a natural level, there are many reasons to despair. On a supernatural level, in the light of the gospel, there's no reason to despair. And so thank you so much, because this is a, a real uh, encouragement to be, to be with you uh, tonight, Your Excellency. So let's get started. Uh, there's so many questions. I know we won't get through all of them. Uh, the first one is from a priest friend of mine. Um, he's asking this, and I, I also ask this from the heart, uh, regarding the letter from the Vatican Secretariat of State, stating that individual celebrations of the Mass are suppressed at the side altars of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and that priests and faithful coming to the Basilica or to Mass there will only be able to take part in one of the four concelebrated masses each morning, as well as other concelebrated masses during the day at the main altars, and also significantly limiting the traditional Latin mass. Uh, Your Excellency, what does this say about the mass, and how should priests and the faithful respond to this? 
First, um, it is surely a very sad uh, measure, uh, and I think it is not correct according to the law of the church itself, and at least uh, according to the true spirit of the canon law, because uh, the canon law, the church always uh, makes the guarantee that uh, every priest should have the freedom to celebrate also individually. It is his right, which the church gives the priest. And the other, that no one can be forced to celebrate. This is also a law of the church. <laughs> and therefore, it is um, a measure which was taken now in, in the Basilica of St. Peter, which is undermining this uh, law of the church itself. And so it is a bad example, which is now giving <clears throat> uh, the Holy See itself to the entire world, so that others will maybe imitate them and go against the law of the church itself. It is a kind of um, implicit persecution against the individual celebration of the Holy Mass of the priest. And, and therefore, we have, to, we have to say this and to ask with humility uh, that the Holy See will, will change this, this new norm again according to the law of the church. So this is the first which what I would like to say. Then the other <clears throat> uh, that the traditional form of the mass is thereby made impossible to celebrate in the basilica itself because in the traditional form there is no concelebration. And then but in some way, thanks be to God, it is still tolerated in the Basilica of St. Peter, but only in the, in the grottos below, in the catacombs. So uh, the traditional mass and the individual mass is now, be is now becoming in Rome, or at least in, in the Basilica of St. Peter, a kind of clandestine mass, the mass of the catacombs. But we know that uh, the circumstances and the time of the catacombs of the clandestine church um, brought plenty fruits for the church. This, this situation of being persecuted and being uh, <clears throat> forced to go uh, to the catacombs this brings abundant fruits for the church, I am convinced. And this was always so in the past. And so it will be also. And therefore, we have to, to keep the supernatural spirit that even this sad uh, situation now, God will use this for a greater uh, benefit, spiritual benefit in his way, which we cannot now understand, but God will find a way that even these sad measures will finally, ultimately bring abundant fruits for the church. Thank you. Yes. Uh... It's so good to hear that encouraging note there because uh, as I said on a natural level, there's so many discouraging things, but you're right. By faith, we know this. We know God's goodness. We know he will bring good out of this. Thank you. I appreciate that. Here, here's the next question. Uh, it's about uh, the church's teaching on the charismatic movement. Um, the question is, um, the questioner asks or says, I know that it was started by the Protestants and that there are some Catholics that do get interested in it. 
but I'm concerned for a friend of mine who is interested in it. As you care for your flock, w- what do you tell them? I've found the charismatic movement to be like Medjugorje. Uh, lots of false teaching and practice, but some people indirectly and not through the charismatic movement grow stronger in their faith. Uh, yet I have seen some people uh, really go off the deep end and get far from the true faith of Christ, becoming like Protestants and rejecting the priesthood, downplaying the sacraments, etc. And so the questioner writes, uh, what do you think and what does the church teach on this? Well, there is no direct teaching concretely about the charismatic movement as, as, as such. Even so, we know that the popes, after the council, the Vatican Council, accepted and even encouraged the Catholic charismatic renewal movement, especially John Paul II. But we have to look on this phenomenon on a more wide um, horizon. And uh, the church is not only 50 years old. The church is 2,000 years old, so we have to keep in mind this. The charismatic movement started more or less 50 years or 55 years ago in the Catholic Church. It is a short time. And this is not a criterion for the authenticity uh, that it was approved by John Paul II. It is not automatic, I mean because the popes can also make some prudential errors in approving some different movements, which after um, they reveal that there are some uh, defects. So we have to look objectively. Then uh, this movement, of course, started, it's historical proven, uh, from Protestant communities in the United States more from African-American Protestant communities in the beginning of the 20th century. So it was a kind of a kind of new even form of religion or a kind of completely new Christian denomination because until then the Christianity had two wings, I mean, principle. It is, the, it, it is the Catholic and the Orthodox Church, which is a um, sacramental structure, an objective with, uh, with the priesthood, the episcopacy, the sacraments, the veneration of the saints, uh, objective uh, expressions of uh, piety and devotion in the church. So it, it is this um, current, uh, the Catholic Orthodox, ecclesiastical, sacramental Christianity. And the other is the Protestant, which came from Martin Luther and the other Protestant so-called reformers, which was not a reform, it's a deformation, not a reformation of the Christianity. So this wing of the Protestant world. So we had basically two worlds, the Catholic Orthodox sacramental objective and the more subjective uh, approach of the entire Protestant world. And not sacramental, not without priesthood and without veneration of Our Lady and the Saints. And now came a third wing, a movement. It is the charismatic from Protestantism, of course. It came because it is is, um, essentially has a mark, a characteristic of subjectivity. So the the subject, uh, my personal experience, my personal feelings um, are becoming essential, central in this new form of Christian denomination or even a kind of religion. Because there are charismatic religions, also um, non-Christian charismatic phenomenons, religions. So in other religions also, where the 
the personal experience and especially the feelings, the sentimental aspect becomes the center of this religion and the criterion. And so this is of course very dangerous because you cannot uh, make the, the element of feeling, which is of course uh, also a valid element. And we have these elements in the Catholic tradition also, uh, because we are, we have a heart. So we have these moments of feeling and also se sentiments in the religion, the Catholic religion, also Orthodox, but it has its place. It's not the center, it's not so essential. It is a um, secondary uh, role. And, so, and, the, and here is the danger of the charismatic movement, uh, either the Catholic charismatic movement or the Protestant, this aspect to do the sentimental, the, sen the sensitive, the, the feeling as so important and central. And to put yourself in some way, your personal feelings to display them to the public. It's, this is also against the necessary um, rule of when you, our Lord said, when you are praying to your father, go in your room and close the door and pray there and the father will see you. But the charismatic movement, they do the contrary. They present uh, their personal experience and feelings to the public. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's in a way, um, I would say it's against the, the pudor, the, in Latin we say the- uh, or mo Modesty, mo modesty. Uh, the, the, the shame, because right. you have also to have not only the, the bodily shame, but you have also to have the spiritual shame. You cannot exhibit yourself completely, neither bodily nor, nor uh, spiritually or your soul to the public. And this is also a characteristic of the charismatic movements. This is a lack of modesty, of discretion, uh, and therefore the church never um, approved this. So historically, now we go back to his history, the, the so-called uh, first charismatic phenomenon in the history of the church was, it was um, the, the true charismatic. It was the Pentecost event. So when the Holy Ghost came and filled uh, Our Lady and the disciples, the apostles on the day of Pentecost, and they were not uh, crying and clapping hands and dancing. Our Lady was not dancing with the apostles there and clapping hands. Our Lady and the apostles were not falling down on the floor to rest in the Holy Spirit as today sometimes it's happening. And they did not present their personal feelings in the Pentecost event. Neither Our Lady nor the apostles. Only St. Peter spoke in an objective, sober way, uh, the gospel truths, but he was, he was filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit and he spoke clear words so everyone could understand him in his own uh, language. So he spoke rational words with a content and, and this fire of the Holy Spirit, they gave them the courage to proclaim Christ and to accept the persecution and to be martyrs and also to be prudent and wise. And so we have the, and they were filled with the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we know that there is a gift of the Holy Spirit, which is prudence, prudence. You have to be prudent. You cannot display all the things in the public, prudent. And then the, the fear of God, to have really a fear of God, reverence, or 
and piety, all these are the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is the charismatic event, the true charismatic event of Pentecost. And then in the second century, there came a fake uh, charismatic event. It was the movement of the Montanists, the Montanism. It was in the second century, a phenomenon in, in Asia, and uh, Phrygia, and there they, they, they were Catholics, even a priest, Montanus, therefore Montanus, they claimed that they had a new Pentecost experience, that the Holy Spirit came again down upon them, they had the baptism of the Spirit and so on, and now they are experiencing the true church is the Church of the Holy Spirit. And then they started to, to spread some practices which were very radical and uh, obeying more to the so-called prophets in their community. And therefore the church condemned this charismatic movement, this Catholic charismatic movement of the second century, the Montanism. And so it was, it was uh, condemned. And so, and since then, the church was very uh, careful on, on this. So there, there is a very good book in English about all these phenomenon, the history and the fem phenomenology of the charismatic. Even it was written maybe 50, uh, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, from Knox, uh, and so the, about the enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, yes. Yes, of uh, the author is Knox. So uh, I would recommend to read this. It's a very um, careful and a very wise presentation of all this phenomenon in, in diverse religious religions and also uh, the problems of this. So I would say of course, the charismatic movement, the Catholic charismatic movement, and, and they have also good qualities and good characteristics. We cannot deny this, especially the zeal for the prayer. So they can take what is good, but the, the, the zeal for the prayer, for the sacrifices, uh, to consecrate yourself to God, and even many charismatic uh, members of Catholic charismatic movements do uh, uh, adoration, Eucharistic adoration, and praying the rosary. This is good, but this is not a specific ca characteristic of the charismatic movement. This is a characteristic of the Catholic tradition to make adoration, to pray, to venerate Our Lady. And so I think we have to help our brothers and sisters in the charismatic movement to come back to the more balanced methods and ways, more sure, more proven, as the, the entire Catholic tradition did this. And then they will bear more fruits and more durable fruits in the church and in their personal life. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bishop. Uh, the book uh, the Bishop is referring to is by Monsignor Ronald Knox, K-N-O-X, and it's entitled Enthusiasm. And uh, that's a very good reference. And thank you for, for that, uh, those reflections. Um, the next question I have uh, is as follows. Is it okay for extraordinary ministers to give communion to the shut-in? So by extraordinary ministers, I suppose they mean, they mean lay people uh, to give communion to the shut-ins and to people in nursing homes. The reason I ask is because the priests in my area will not uh, do so. And lay people feel it is their duty to get communion to people who so desperately want it. Also, I was a little disturbed, the questioner asks, uh, or states, I was a little disturbed, he says, to find out that one of the extraordinary ministers took one of the hosts home for four hours because the recipient was unable to receive our Lord at the time of the visit. What does the church teach about extraordinary ministers? Well, that is not a teaching of the church. It's only a problem of discipline, not of doctrine. 
And this discipline, after the council, uh, it was allowed, unfortunately, I will I stress this, that lay people can distribute Holy Communion during Mass. It was completely not necessary. And it was against the entire tradition. Never in the 2000 tradition of the church, um, being it in the East or in the West, never, I stress, lay people had, could distribute Holy Communion during Holy Mass. Now, I stress during Holy Mass, never. This is against the entire tradition. We have to abolish this. We cannot continue this because if there is a priest celebrating Mass, there is no necessity for lay people. Even if the, the, the celebration can be prolonged, why not? We have to take time for the Lord. It's not a cafeteria service that we have to, to finish this. It's completely impossible. And our Orthodox brothers and sisters or the Orthodox churches, they give us the example. Even in the Orthodox church, which I know the, the Byzantine Orthodox church, even the deacon cannot touch the body of Christ and, and give the, the Holy Communion. It's impossible. Only the priest and the bishop, even if there are a thousand uh, people, they, they, will, they will wait. The people will wait. Because this is the greatest gift to the body of Christ. And for this greatest gift, we have to take time, time, to receive it and not to, to make quickly, to spare time for this. This has to be the moment of the distribution of Holy Communion, has to be the most sacred and holy moment, not a quick moment to, to, to give quickly the Holy Communion. And therefore, uh, we have to, in the Catholic, at, before the council, it was so that the deacons could give Holy Communion, but extraordinary ministers were the deacons before the council, because they are ordained, at least. They are, have a sacramental ordination, and so they could give the Holy Communion. And this is one. The other thing, we have to distinguish, please, the praxis of extraordinary so-called ministers, lay people during mass and outside mass. These are for me uh, very important differences. So outside the mass, of course, there was the tradition in the church during the persecution times, even in the first centuries. And in my, in my experience in the Soviet clandestine church, lay people, could give Holy Communion, but only outside Holy Mass to bring Holy Communion to the uh, prisoners or to dying persons. Even my own mother gave Holy Communion to her mother, to my grandmother, when she was ill and there was no priest. Well, this is, these are possibilities that, that in these cases, when there is no priest, to bring Holy Communion to dying persons or to prisoners, uh, lay people with the permission of a priest or, or of a bishop can bring the Holy Communion to these uh, Catholics. Of course, this is possible, but they have to do this with, uh, with the greatest possible reverence. So not uh, even when they have the permission to to bring there, in this case, for example, they have to have in their houses a tabernacle or a small room reserved only for this uh, purpose, for prayer or to deposit there the body of Christ. I don't know the circumstances, but if, if there should be such circumstances, as was in our case in the persecution, there was a, my grand aunt, she had 
a room and there was a hidden tabernacle with the Blessed Sacrament. There we became there and made adoration because it was persecution time. So in these cases, I repeat, they could be done, but with, with, with the greatest possible reverence towards the body of Christ. This is important. And then the other aspect, when lay people bring the body of Christ to the sick or prisoners, they have to help them to make act of contrition because we have to receive the body of Christ with a purified heart. So to, to make, or when they have um, serious sins, then better not to receive and to ask a priest to come to, to hear confession. And so in this case, these extraordinary ministers have to seek a priest, even from far, why not? And to invite him, to bring him, to drive him. This would be a good service of the extraordinary ministers, to drive a priest even from far, even when the own priest is not willing to hear confession of a dying person, then please organize you, extraordinary minister, organize uh, a trip, bring a priest, and he confesses this dying or this uh, prisoner, and he himself gives him then Holy Communion. So it has to be organized and be inventive, creative, uh, to really to provide that these people receive the holy confession to purify their souls. It is even more important in some way, the confession, the sacrament, then to receive Holy Communion, then to purify your soul. And so at least, and then you can make spiritual communion also. So these have to be distinguished all these aspects. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, the person asks, what is the church's teaching on submission within marriage? It is a given that the husband should not dominate his wife, but it seems as though the magisterium after Vatican II is embarrassed by what the sacred scripture says by speaking about a mutual submission with no authoritative head. What are we to believe about the role between husband and wife in marriage as Catholics? Just to be clear, that's the wording that the questioner asked. Um, uh, I should make a disclaimer that these are not the ways I would word questions, but uh, it's a very fair question. So uh, there you well, go. Well, we have to, to follow the Holy Scripture and that the church cannot be above the Holy Scripture. The church is below the Holy Scripture. <clears throat> And St. Paul says, what has to be the, the, the true relationship and the, in, in, in a marriage that is the same relationship analogously, certainly, as Christ and the church. The church is the bride and Christ is the bridegroom. So the spouse and as Christ, this should be the, and this is, because the sacrament of the marriage is a sacrament, a sign of the relation of the union of Christ and the church. This is the, the content of the sacrament. And therefore from this content flows the practical behavior. So of course Christ is the, 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 the head and therefore we cannot deny that the, the husband is not the head of the family. He is, because the marriage is a sacramental sign of this relationship of Christ, who is the head, and uh, the bride, which is the church. In this case, the bride, the, the, the wife. And so, but it is not a domination because Christ is not dominating us. Christ is loving us and Christ is giving his life for us. And so this is the task of, of the husband to love really uh, his wife and to give his life even for his wife and then including his children, his family, as Christ did this. You see, this is a very important 
and demanding task to be had, to be in some way the boss of the family. <laughs> it's demanding. And so uh, when we will, when we want to leave the family and the, uh, the marriage according to the word of God. And, and therefore, and then uh, the, the wife is submitted in this way. It is the order, I mean, because it's the order of creation. God created first Adam and then Eve. And, uh, and so in the same Adam is representing Christ, Eve is representing Mary, Mary is the new Eve. So all this symbology which God gave us in the Holy Scripture. But the key of this relationship between the head and the, the wife submitted, it is submission means here that the, the wife, she's respecting his her husband, respect, I mean, respect as the head. And so in the love and respect, this is mutually connected. You cannot separate love and respect. So you respect him or her mutually. This is, and therefore the wife is the heart and the, the man is the head according to God's plan. And so it should be in the marriage. But as um, Archbishop Fulton Sheen once, uh, he wrote a very beautiful short um, book uh, about the marriage where he made this expression, uh, you marry, there are not two marry, but three marry. I mean, three marry, do, do the marriage. It is uh, the husband, the wife, and Christ. So they are, and so when Christ is in your midst, then uh, the, the wife is also in some way submitted according to the teaching of the church, of, of the gospel, and then of the, of the teaching of, of the apostles and the church. Um, in this way, I mean, in the supernatural uh, view, but based on the order of creation. It's not a worldly domination to be had or to be obedient, submitted to the husband. It is an expression of respect and love also. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, the next few questions are about the holy sacrifice of the mass. And this one reads, um, the questioner uh, says, to fulfill my Sunday obligation, is it licit for me to attend a Sede Vicantis church like Pius V? In my area, there's no reverent mass that I can go to. There is no society of Pius X either. I am worried for my salvation. No, it's never permitted to attend in this case because this is a, a, a true schismatic community we, because they are denying the truth that, that the church has a head concretely. So, so the Sede Vacantis is a true schismatic community in some way com comparable with the Orthodox churches who also deny that there is a head, that the difference is of course between the Orthodox and the Sede Vacantis that the Orthodox deny the principle of the prim primacy of the Pope, which the Sede Vacantis do not deny the principle that there is the primacy of the Pope, the dogma. But they deny this dogma in the praxis, the Sede Vacantis. Because now 70 years, there is no head of the church or someone goes back to 80 years, others community go back to 100 years, others go back 50 years. Now others are saying now with Francis, there is no more Pope. Now um, eight years and so on. 
it is a completely subjectivist, really a subjectivism criterion. It's against reason, against common sense, and against the, the trust in God, that God is always, even in the, in the worst situations in the history of the church, there was also, there was always a Pope. Well, there had been a short time of, of, said, of vacancy of the See of Peter, but not a considerable period of time. And therefore, in this case, the Sede Vacantis, they are denying in praxis the reality of the primacy of the Pope. And this is as an essential part of our Catholic faith. And in this point, they are in some way similar to the Orthodox communities who are denying both the practical, concrete aspect of the papacy and the theoretical, the dogma. And so, therefore, we cannot go to, in this case, to the Sede Vacantis Mass when we believe truly in the fullness of the revealed truth of the primacy of the Pope, which cannot God leave his church so long time without a head. So we are, according to the Sede Vacantis, the church has no head. So it is, it, it is a without head. And so it's against the visibility of the church. And I repeat, it is coming closer to the Orthodox because the Orthodox say the, the church, the, the, the head of the church is invisible, they say. It's only Christ. So the church can exist, say the Orthodox, um, without a visible head. They say the Orthodox. And in some way, now they, they say the Vacantists, they say also the church now is existing now already 70, 80 years or more without a visible head. So it is, uh, I repeat, against the, the, the fundamental structure which God gave to the church, the visibility also of a head of the Pope, the bishop, the priest is a visibility. So, and therefore, we cannot do this when we, have, when we believe in the fullness of the primacy. Is, uh, it's, it's a difference between the Society of Pius X, because the Society of Pius X, they, be, they accept the Pope and they name him in the Mass, they pray for him. So, there are Catholics in this way. They, they cannot only, the problem is that they do not obey him in concrete orders, which the, Pope's, the Pope gave, but this is a, only a canonical aspect, a, an exterior aspect of obedience, which is in this concrete extraordinary crisis of the church in some way justified the situation of Pius X's community, because the, the the crisis is so enormous and uh, the pope the popes uh, in some way helped and promote promoted promoted some bad things in the church in the liturgy and so on which justifies in this case uh, the situation of the Society of Pius X. It's a temporary. But I think that the importance is uh, to believe in the primacy and it's not all, only nece always necessary for the fullness of the Catholic truth to, to obey to every singular uh, order of a Pope. But to obey when he commands the doctrine, which is the, the true doctrine of Christ, then of course we have to obey to the Pope. And in this case, the Society of Pius X obeys the, 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 the true doctrine, which the church always had in this case, but only the concrete canonical 
um, submission in this case it is difficult in our time so this is the difference between the situation of pious tense and the sede vacantis communities now I, i'd like to ask a question in my own name as a follow-up uh thank you for that for that response uh, your excellency um i'm sure you've heard this i know i've heard this a number of times over the years in my studies, uh, uh, the claim is made, and it may even be in the 83 Code of Canon Law, that in danger of death, and I think that's the key, in danger of death, a Catholic may, I may be not getting this exactly right, and please correct me, but a uh, Catholic may receive viaticum from an Eastern Orthodox or um, another a priest in, in schism with us, uh, not in full communion, they'll say, um, because it's a valid Eucharist. And in that case, uh, I suppose, would that be, if, the, if that's correct, which I'm not even sure that makes sense, uh, uh, but if that's correct, then in a case like that, would the f uh, danger of death, would a faithful Catholic be able to receive viaticum from a schismatic priest of, of any sort, Pius V or anything like that? Well, there is uh, in the canon law, a uh, uh, canon that says that um, even um, an excommunicated priest, excommunicated, <clears throat> um, he can give the sacraments, also the absolution, and of course the Holy Communion to a dying person in the, in, the, in the danger of death, an excommunicated priest can give the absolution. I mean, this is the most important, I repeat, the absolution, the sacrament of penance. The Holy Communion you can receive also spiritually, but the, for me the most important is also the absolution from your sins. And this can, can do a schismatic priest an excommunicated priest, according to the canon law, because the, the, here is the salvation of the soul, the, 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 the most important law in this case. Maybe he can also give Holy Communion. The Vaticum, I think it's also possible for a schismatic priest, for, for a dying person, but not simply for a sick person or um, or in a, in a situation of persecution, I will not say this, right. because the church never allowed in the first centuries that her heretic or schismatic priests were not allowed in the first centuries during the persecution time of the church to give uh, sacraments, only really in the danger of death con concretely. No, good, thank you. And that's a very important distinction. Um, the next question again is on the mass. Uh, the, the person asks, there is no Latin, or they'll say here, there's no Latin mass close by us. And the mass as celebrated in the regular parish is very irreverent, sad, and disturbing. Because there is a current relaxation of the precept that we attend mass every Sunday, I'm assuming it's a Bishop, where for the COVID situation and they're relaxing the the uh, precept, and that's a whole issue in, unto itself. Uh, but because there is a current relaxation of the precept that we attend Mass every Sunday, often lately we have been staying home on Sunday mornings. Uh, the questioner says, "As a father, I lead the family in the Mass prayers from the traditional Latin Mass. In it, we actually pray. As a family, we chant the ancient Latin." read and reflect on the readings, use holy water like candles and make a heartfelt spiritual communion. He says, it sounds wonderful, but is it? Are we doing the right thing by avoiding mass at the local parish? To what extent should families seek mass when there is no obligation? What situation is best for our children? These are many questions, sorry. Uh, what do you think your parents would do? Well, it depends on the extent of the irreverences at that parish. I don't know this concrete situation. So <clears throat> if it is 
really dangerous, the irreverences or the heresies or the ambiguities in doctrine which, he, which the, the priest is, is preaching, I repeat, then it's better not to go there. And in this case, it is justified, the example which you gave, to be at home and, and to make, as we did in the Soviet time, because we had no priests. And then, yes, but in this case, this father of family has to organize at least uh, once a month a real trip to another place with his family to assist a real worthy Sunday Mass. Uh, maybe he can seek in the nearby or in his region another church uh, where is at least even the novice or they celebrate it in a worthy manner or a Latin Mass. So he has to seek a possibility and then to make the sacrifice to travel. Uh, we traveled in the Soviet Union in 70 miles for Sunday Mass. One direction, 70 miles back. And it, it is for me uh, one of the most beautiful experiences in, in my life, the Sunday Mass is the trips to the Sunday Mass. So it is, then all your life you are impressed on this, on this importance. So in this case, I would suggest to do this, at, even if he cannot do this every Sunday, but at least once a month or twice, depends on the distance. Oh, that's great. Um, the next question. Uh, I do, do number 14, I think, Michael. Okay. 14, okay, I'll skip I right think that'll down. be great, yeah. On the uh, being simple, okay, yes. Uh, Christopher, make sure that I'm asking. It's the on the vaccine, what, what is the principle which makes that one? Oh, okay. That's okay. I'm sorry. I had that as 15. I got it. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. A question on the vaccine. Very good. Thank you, Christopher. Um, what is the principle which makes the vaccine that uses stem cells from aborted babies immoral? For example, is it the disrespect of the body or scandal cooperation with evil, for example? And then there, they say part two to this question if the aborted baby's body was properly buried with the exception of the minimum number of cells for the development of the vaccines, would the vaccine then be licit? The, the basic uh, evil here is that this is connected to the murder, the assassination of an innocent unborn child. So you cannot simply if there, this is the, uh, the deepest root of the evil, in which you go in and in some way you are connecting personally, individually yourself with this long line of crimes, which all are connected. There is no moment where you can separate these. And so now I am not more touched by this evil. You are touched. You have the uh, the step of this in your body then. Even if there would be 0.001%, it's not a matter. There is. It's simply common sense. You have not to be an Aristoteles or Thomas Aquinas. It is common sense. It is common sense. If there would not have being the assassination of an innocent child. You could not have your medicine or your vaccine. It's simply, uh, and therefore, I repeat, there is no moment when there is uh, the ch chain of all these connected crimes. They are connected crimes because otherwise you will not um, be able to get your vaccine or your, your drug. And so this is the crime, the assassination, and then we are entering in all this chain, even in the most remote way. There is the connection. And in this case, it's an individual, you personally. You are now before the 
this vaccine tube. So you confront this personally. Here I am I, and here is this product, the product of the assassination, the ultimate product. Even if it had been only tested, it is connected. Why should it have been tested? Please take other which has no connection, even not testing nothing, then, then take this. But since it has this even smallest connection, you are entering. And now you're confronting this evil, this horrible massacre, this child sacrifice, this modern child sacrifice in a so a sophisticated, cunning way. I repeat, sophisticated, cunning way. Is the world administrating us Catholics? Please take this. It's a benefit for your health based on the tears of this innocent child. They can already weep in the womb of the mother. They do. And you cannot take cells from a dead body. No. There to be a living body. And this is horrible. Second crime, to extract the cells not from a, a corpse, a, a dead body, no, from a living one. The second crime, horrible, the extraction of the self. And it would be a cynicism to say, oh, well, we had killed the, the baby, we had extracted the cells, and then we give them a, a honorable funeral. It, it would be a greatest cynicism to do this. And therefore, all these arguments which you mentioned are completely without fundamentation, lastly. And the, another very important uh, aspect that by this acceptance, we are silencing our fiery protest against any use of body parts of the unborn assassinated children for medical research, because this is a big industry, the fatal technology today. And when we accept the vaccine, even only test it, what does it mean only, only test it? It's already horrible to test such things. Then, you are silencing your protest. You have to make a flaming, fiery protest against this. And this is, you are contradicting. And your voice is then silencing. An the entire church now accepting this, we are silencing our protest. And in this way, we are in this way of accepting aborted, tainted medicines and vaccines or I repeat, even only test it, we are ultimately collaborating with the great, immense culture of death. And we are committing a great sin of omission in this historical moment of protesting uncompromisingly protesting against any abuse of body parts of assassinated unborn children and of all this horrible, fatal technology and, and commercialization. We have to be clear as our first, uh, the Christians, and, uh, and there is not helping no other um, analogies or uh, compar compar comparisons is helping here. It, it is not applicable, no? It is so unique, this, this moment, this aspect of the assassination 
and this concatenation, it's so unique that you cannot adduce some historical example, some interesting historical example to justify this. No, it's unique. Thank you, Bishop. Your uh, outspoken statements about this and those of uh, your fellow Bishop uh, Strickland in Texas has empowered many of the faithful to speak out about this. Um, many scholars have, uh, or at least a small number of us, have been speaking out along the same lines. Uh, no toleration. Uh, to, to many of us, it seems uh, not even as much a question of cooperation in evil, but, but a question of benefiting from ill-gotten gains, which is very severely condemned in Scripture, in the book of Proverbs. Uh, they say, uh, I think it's in Proverbs 11, do not benefit from ill-gotten gains, but through righteousness and repentance you will find life. Exactly. Not through ill-gotten gains, uh, and the life we're looking for is spiritual, supernatural life, not just the life of the body. Um, there must be no compromise on this, absolutely. I, I could not agree more, and I'm sorry to add my own thoughts here, but at the same time, it's so, it's so extremely important. And uh, I, I think the Vatican uh, guidelines are, are, are misconstrued. Uh, they're, 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 uh, it, it does undermine our witness. Um, uh, there can be no compromise on this, not, not at all. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for your witness, uh, Your Excellency. We're so grateful. Um, Chris, do we have time for one more question or are we... No, we're, we're, we have to be respectful of His Excellency's time. You got, so, okay, great. So yeah. we'll continue again. Uh, next next time so in much. April. So Your Excellency, I'm going to put on the screen the prayer uh, that we pray that the Holy Father will consecrate Russia. And can you lead us in that prayer? And then can you uh, give a special blessing upon the Filipino uh, listeners tonight and on their nation that are celebrating 500 years of the Catholic faith? I'm going to put... Uh, on my screen now, the, the prayer that the Holy Father will consecrate Russia. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Immaculate Heart of Mary, you are the Holy Mother of God and our tender Mother. Look upon the distress in which the Church and the whole of humanity are living because of the spread of materialism and the persecution of the church. In Fatima, you warned against these errors as you spoke about the errors of Russia. You are the mediatrix of all graces. Implore your divine son to grant this special grace for the Pope that he might consecrate Russia to your immaculate heart so that Russia will be converted, a period of peace will be granted to the world, and your Immaculate Heart will triumph through an authentic renewal of the Church in the splendor of the purity of the Catholic faith, of the sacredness of divine worship, and of the holiness of the Christian life. O Queen of the Holy Rosary, and our sweet mother, turn your merciful eyes to us and graciously hear this our trusting prayer. Amen. Amen. We entrust to Our Lady, the Philippine country, the Philippine church, the Catholic church, and all that they will remain faithful to their Catholic faith and to their love for the Holy Eucharist and Our Lady. And I will extend this blessing especially to our Catholic brothers and sisters from the Philippines and thanking them for their example all over the world, which they are giving with their fidelity to the Catholic faith. Dominus vobiscum. Ecum spiritus. Et benedictio Dei omnipotentis patris et filii et Spiritus Sancti descendet super vos, et maniat semper. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Your Excellency, for... Um...
Welcome. coming on tonight. We really appreciate it. So inspired by your witness. Um, and we're looking forward to um, more, more answers uh, next time, April the 13th. Well, I wish you all a, a blessed Sunday of the letare of the, the joy in the Lord. All of you and your families. And you as well, Your Excellency. Thank you so much.